But before you're seated, if you want to hold your hands, palm face up as we receive this morning's blessing. Children, may you be united with Christ and receive the comfort of his love and be encouraged to follow in the ways of Christ as it will not lead you astray. Young people, in all you do, may you have the same mindset of Christ Jesus who took the very nature of a servant. And as you learn to serve others, may you experience the grace of our Lord and Savior. Adults, may you continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act according to fulfill his good pleasure. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Great. Kids, you guys are dismissed. You may be seated. Thanks, kids, for worshiping alongside us this morning. Good to have you uh, with us, and I hope you learn a whole lot in your classrooms and have fun. Well, this morning we're starting a brand new series that's going to teach us all the way through, take us all the way through the summer. It's a study in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we're kind of subtitling it, A Jesus-Shaped Community, How Jesus and the Gospel of Jesus Shapes Our Community, can give kind of understanding of who we are and what it is that God has called us to do. And so we're going to work our way through the book of 1 Thessalonians all the way through the summer. And uh, it's good for us to do this from time to time, to just kind of zero in on a, on a book or a passage of Scripture and just kind of let it kind of stay there for a while and kind of work our way all the way through it. The Christians in Thessalonica, as were the, the case in a lot of places and just kind of common in that time, were experiencing persecution and suffering for their faith and their allegiance to Jesus as their King, as their Messiah. And so Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, his first letter here, is a letter of encouragement to help them to stay faithful to the ways and the calls of God in their life. And there's really a lot that we can learn from this short letter to the Thessalonians as if it were a letter to us, how we can be faithful to the ways of God and the culture and the ways that we find ourselves. So here's the plan. I want to kind of lay it out for you this summer. We're going to take a chapter every week all the way through the summer, and we're just going to zero in on what do we feel like God is telling us through the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians, how we can live our life faithful in light of eternity, in light of God's kingdom. How can we, how can we have our community and our church body shaped by Jesus and by his gospel, by his good news? But the book of 1 Thessalonians is not very long. It's actually just five chapters long. It's not very long. So what you see in your worship folder, hopefully you got one as you came in, there's discussion questions that we've given you. And they're now they're just for chapter one because we're going to zero in on chapter one this morning. But here's what we want to do as a collective church body. And we're just going to carry this all the way through the summer. What I'm asking you to do is take the book of 1 Thessalonians and to read it in its entirety in one sitting this week. It's not very long. Five chapters may take you 35 minutes. It's not going to take forever, right? What I want you to do is carve out an hour, maybe an hour and a half every week this summer. And I want you to read through the entire book of 1 Thessalonians in one sitting every week. And then I want you to have the the discussion questions that we'll provide you for each chapter going along. Read through the entire book in its entirety. Have the discussion questions with you. And maybe sit across the table with somebody, maybe in your life group, maybe at the coffee house, maybe just at your coffee table in your living room. But just use those questions to spark conversation and maybe the Lord will be leading you to, to something or another that you can take with you, that you can have implement into your life. But over the next few weeks, we're just going to simply try to read over this book every week. Again, it's not very long. Take an hour to an hour and a half this week. Just read over it and have the discussion questions and to just see what the Lord may do, uh, not only in our conversations this morning and each week as we gather to kind of dice up and see what we can learn in specifics, but overall, what is the Lord teaching you? So we're going to start this week and kind of go from there. Well, as we've done in the past, we've done, as we've looked at a, a book or a, a theme of the scriptures like this, what's been helpful for us, and we found it to be helpful for us, and we found it to be helpful for many of us, is to see kind of a video overview of the entire book. Where is Paul going? What's going on? And what's the backstory of this letter, the first Thessalonians letter to, or the first letter to the Thessalonians 
uh, here in the church. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to watch a short video, and hopefully it's encouraging, but hopefully it also just kind of gives you a good framework and overview of what this letter is about and what's going on kind of behind the scenes. And then we'll kind of dice into chapter one specifically as it goes from there. So let's check this out, and I'll come back and lead us in it. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. This is most likely the earliest letter that we have from Paul, and the backstory for it is found in the book of Acts. It's where Paul and his co-worker Silas went to the ancient Greek city of Thessalonica. And after just one month of telling people the good news about Jesus, a large number of Jewish and Greek people gave their allegiance to Jesus, and they formed the first church community there. But trouble was brewing. Paul's announcement of the risen Jesus as the true Lord of the world, it led to suspicion. So the Christians in Thessalonica were eventually accused of defying Caesar, the Roman emperor, when they said that there is another king, Jesus. And this led to a persecution that got so intense, Paul and Silas actually had to flee from the city. And this was painful for them because they loved the people there so much. And so this letter is Paul's attempt to reconnect with the Christians in Thessalonica after he got a report from Timothy that they were doing more than okay, they were flourishing despite this intense persecution. He designed the letter to have two main movements. First is a celebration of their faithfulness to Jesus, and then he challenges them to keep growing as followers of Jesus. And then these two movements are surrounded by three prayers. The letter opens with a thanksgiving prayer, the two movements are linked together by a transitional prayer, and then the whole thing is concluded with a final prayer. It's a beautiful design. Paul opens by giving thanks and celebrating the Thessalonians' faith, their love for others, and their hope in Jesus despite persecution. He goes on to retell the story of their conversion, how they used to be idolatrous polytheists, and they were living in a culture where all of life was permeated by institutions and practices that honored the Greek and Roman gods. And Paul talks about how they turned away from those idols to serve the living and true God, and that they're now waiting for the coming of God's Son from heaven. So in a city like Thessalonica, transferring your allegiance to the creator God of Israel and to King Jesus, this came at a cost. Isolation from your neighbors, hostility from your family. But for the Thessalonians, the overwhelming love of Jesus who died for them and the hope of his return, it made it all worth it. Paul then retells the story of his mission in Thessalonica and of the dear friendships he formed with the people. He uses really intimate metaphors here. They treated him like their child, and he became like their mother and like their father. He says, we were happy to share with you not only the good news from God, but our very selves, because we came to dearly love you. Paul reminds us here that the essence of Christian leadership is not about power and having influence. It's about healthy relationships and humble, loving service. He reminds them that he never asked for money. He simply came to love and serve them in the name of Jesus. And so Paul moves on to reflect on their common persecution. Just like Jesus was rejected and killed by his own people, so now Paul is persecuted by his fellow Jews, and the Thessalonians are facing hostility from their Greek neighbors. And Paul draws a strange comfort from knowing that together their sufferings are a way of participating in the story of Jesus' own life and death. Paul then shares about the anguish he experienced when he heard of the hardships the Thessalonians had after he and Silas fled. So he sent Timothy to support them and see how they were doing. And to his joy, Timothy discovered that they were going strong. They were faithful to Jesus. They were full of love for God and their neighbors. And they longed to see Paul as much as he longed to see them. And so Paul concludes with a prayer for endurance. And what's cool is that he introduces here the topics he's going to address in the letter's second half. He prays that God will grow their capacity to love, that he'll strengthen their commitment to holiness as they fix their hope on the return of King Jesus. So he opens the letter's second movement by challenging them to a life that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus. So this means, first of all, a serious commitment to holiness and sexual purity. In contrast to the promiscuous, sexually destructive culture around them, they are to follow Jesus' teaching about experiencing the beauty and the power of sex within the haven of a committed marriage covenant relationship. God takes sexual misbehavior seriously, Paul says. It dishonors and destroys people and their dignity. 
Following Jesus also means a commitment to loving and serving others. So Paul instructs them that Christians should be known in the city as reliable people who work really hard, not just to make money, but so that they can have resources to provide for themselves and to generously share with people who are in need. After this, Paul addresses a number of questions the Thessalonians had raised about the future hope of Jesus' return. So some Christians in the church had recently died, most likely killed as martyrs, and their friends and family are wondering about their fate when Jesus returns. And so Paul makes it clear that despite their grief and loss, not even death can separate Christians from the love of Jesus. When he returns as king, he will call both the living and the dead to himself. And Paul uses a really cool image here. He uses language that would normally describe how a city subject to the Roman Caesar would send out a delegation to welcome or meet his arrival. Paul then applies this imagery to the arrival of King Jesus. He too will be greeted by a delegation of his people who will go to meet the Lord in the air as they welcome and escort him back to this world where he'll establish his kingdom of justice and peace. Paul then wants the Thessalonians to see how this hope should motivate faithfulness to Jesus. So he pokes fun at the famous Roman propaganda that it's Caesar who brings peace and security. Of course, Rome's peace came through violence, through enslaving their enemies, and military occupation. And Paul warns that Jesus will return as king one day and confront this kind of injustice. Followers of King Jesus should live in the present as if that future day is already here. Despite the nighttime of human evil around them, they should stay sober and awake as the light of God's kingdom dawns here on earth as it is in heaven. Paul closes all of these exhortations like he began with a hopeful prayer, that God would permeate their lives with his holiness, that he would set them apart to be completely devoted and blameless until the return of King Jesus. First Thessalonians reminds us that from the very beginning, following Jesus as king has produced a truly countercultural or holy way of life. And this will sometimes generate suspicion and conflict among our neighbors. But the response of Jesus' followers to such hostility should always be love, meeting opposition with grace and generosity. And this way of life, it's motivated by hope in the coming kingdom of Jesus that has already begun in his resurrection from the dead. And so holiness, love, and future hope, that's what First Thessalonians is all about. So that kind of gives you a good overview of the whole letter, as it were, the whole thing, kind of snapshot as kind of a bird's eye view. Uh, and as we're going to get into some of Paul's instructions and his teachings about uh, holy living and those kind of things later on in the letter. But this morning, I want to zero our attention into the first opening lines of the letter, just of chapter one, and how this uh, letter begins and it shapes us and teaches us about what the church is like, about what constitutes, what makes up the church, and how do we understand this church that it is kind of growing, as it were, the, in the ancient world. And so if you have your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open to First Thessalonians and just kind of keep it open because we're going to be there much of the morning, pretty much all the morning. We're just going to kind of zero in on this first chapter of First Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'll read just the first couple of verses here. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul says this, To the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing I want us to zero in on notice about the Thessalonian church and what identifies the Thessalonian church as a community, as a community of, of apprentices or followers of Jesus. And the same kind of thing that may identify us is that Paul describes the church as a community of people that derive their life or that derives their life from God himself. That the church derives its life and its source of, of identity from God. He says this, is who the, this letter is going to be to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That their identity, in other words, their understanding of who they are is rooted in their identity with Christ. 
That they are drawing their life, their, their power from God himself. Because there were gatherings of people all over the place in the ancient world. Just like there are gatherings of people all over the place in our world. There are gatherings of people with common interests and common likes and they can get together. They can have fellowship. They can share meals and they can have fun times together. They can do all those. That was happening then. It is happening today. But what distinguishes the church from any other organization? What makes the church different than any other kind of club that you may have some social affinity with? Well, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear, right at the very very beginning of his letter to the Thessalonians, that what makes the church different from any other institution around is that the church is God-centered. It draws its life, its identity, its power from God himself, not from any other, other place, not from any human person. In other words, the church is not a human institution at all. The church is not a human endeavor. The church, God's people, is a divine society that God himself establishes and that he is the one who bonds us together. We've said this before in other circumstances, other places, but the church, and if I could say clearly, crossroads, is not a social club for us to just kind of come and do what we want to do and meet with people that we kind of like sometimes. The church is not just another social club or even another service club where we do nice things for people. The church is the means by which God is bringing about His good kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. The church is the means by which God is restoring His good shalom in this world. It is the church that is doing this. And it derives its power and its life from God Himself. And when we understand the identity of the church that is rooted in who God is and not just human institution, then it changes how we approach the church. It changes how we approach our gatherings. It changes how we approach our seeing one another. It changes everything about it, that we are not gathered here. This church doesn't belong or doesn't doesn't happen here so that we can have something to do on a Sunday morning. The church doesn't happen for us to to give us something that we want or, or to take care of our kids so they don't, Go do bad things. But the church, when it is rooted in a divine understanding that God has placed His his root and His power and His life here in His body and His church, then it is a place where we learn and we practice a new way of living. The way of the kingdom rather than the way of the world. The church then is a way in which we can practice and we can learn to take up a new value and ethic and standard where we are no longer driven by the things of the world, but we are driven by the things of God. So Paul uses just this opening line of his letter to remind the Thessalonians, and I hope that he would remind us as well, that the church's identity is not in a human institution or just in our affinity and affiliation with each other, but is rooted in God himself. God himself. But there's more than that. There's more than that. Because what gets Paul's attention about the report he gets from Timothy, what, Paul, what gets Paul's attention is the, the Thessalonians' genuine faith that when they received the message of the gospel that Jesus is king and that he's reigning right now, and that they received it with such tenacity, with such ferventhood. They, they received it and they remained faithful even in face of persecution when their families and their friends ridiculed them and turned their backs on them and when they were forced to, to kind of leave their places and In the face of all of that, they remained faithful to the gospel, to the truth of Jesus. And what he mentions here at the opening lines of the letter, he mentions their faith. He mentions their love for one another. And he mentions their hope in the sure coming of Jesus. And that is the second thing I want us to look at, at what defines the church, this community. Because the second thing that we see in in this letter for Thessalonians is that the church is a community that is known for its faith, for its hope, and for its love. And we've heard those words before. They're in our mission statement. The Apostle Paul uses them a whole lot of other times in his letters. But I want us to notice something maybe differently about these qualities of the Christian church. Maybe things that you have overlooked from time to time. I want you to notice a few things about faith, about hope, and about love, especially the way the Apostle Paul describes them, not only in Thessalonians, but in other places. 
The first thing is notice that each of these qualities of the Christian church are out-focused. They're outgoing. They're not inward-focused. Sometimes we may get the the thinking that these are just internal postures. They're just some things that we kind of have in ourselves. But each of them draw our attention outside of us. Each of these draw our attention outward. They're outgoing. Faith is always directed towards God. True, genuine faith is trusting and believing that the ways of Jesus actually lead to eternal life. They're focused outward. They're not focused on me. But true faith really trusts in God himself that leads to obedience. Trusting and believing and leading my life to obedience. So faith, genuine faith is always outward. And it always has and and, uh, is associated with some kind of action applied to it. Action applied. Hope is directed towards the sure coming of Jesus a second time, the fulfillment of his kingdom. The fact that we long for and pray for the day when we will see Jesus return and establish his good kingdom for eternity right here on earth where we can experience his goodness and his abundance for eternity in the future. Something we will talk about a little bit later, but something we long for, we pray for, and we live in that reality even now. And love if it's genuine biblical love, is always outward. Always. Love is always generated or aimed towards other people. Biblical love is when you will the best for another person. Biblical love is when you desperately want what is best for another person. So all of these qualities of faith, of hope, and of love, all of these qualities are outward focused. They're outward focused. Second thing I want you to notice about these three qualities of the Christian church and Christian life is that these, each of these qualities are productive. Productive. Again, sometimes we think of these things are just kind of invisible qualities of the heart. Well, that person has a lot of faith. That person has a lot of hope. It's just this internal goodness of their heart. But the way the Apostle Paul talks about these qualities of the church, the qualities of the Christian life, both here in Thessalonians as well as in other places in the Scriptures, is that these have concrete, very practical results. You see them. They produce some kind of change in someone's life, in someone's experience, and in someone's behavior. They are productive. They produce something. Faith always leads to obedience. Always. Otherwise, it's just theoretical talking around things. But if you never obey, if you never put action behind it, it's not really faith. It's just theoretical. True love for other people will always lead you to labor for them, to work for their benefit, for their good, to always do for them what's best for them. Always. Otherwise, it's nice sentiment It's a nice, good feeling in your heart, but that's not biblical love. It's a good, warm, fuzzy, but biblical love always always leads to laboring and working for the betterment of another person. That's love. Remember the most famous scripture that's ever been written or ever been recited? For God so loved the world that he gave. Biblical love always has some kind of working and laboring for another person. It wasn't that God so loved the world that he had warm fuzzies and just kind of looked at us from a distance. But biblical love always produces work for the one you love. Always. A hope, a true, genuine biblical hope looks expectantly for God's return, for the Lord's coming, for he will establish his good kingdom. And that kind of hope produces endurance and patience for the Lord, where we're not running on fear and anxiety, but we're faithfully enduring the hardships and the trials, even today, that that kind of hope produces endurance and patience in this life. Otherwise, it's just wishful thinking. It's kind of whistling in the dark. Genuine faith, genuine hope, genuine biblical love will always produce concrete and practical examples of that internal reality. Always. So these qualities are outgoing. They're focused on outside of us. They're not internal just for us. 
And they're always productive, producing. Third thing I want us to notice about the Thessalonian church, and by extension, our church, is that when a church receives the gospel, when the church receives the truth about Jesus and about what he has done for us to establish his good kingship and his kingdom in our life, then it extends the gospel. It produces and it extends, it spreads the good news, the gospel of Jesus. Picking up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, Paul says it this way, The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has been known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serving the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. The church and individual Christ followers, when we understand the gospel, it extends from us. It spreads from us. We live in a media-saturated culture. You don't need me to tell you that. You know this. All sorts of mediums of media all over. Television, radio, Snapchat, Facebook, social media on your phones, all over the place. There are are media forms all over. And there are followers of Jesus that are trying to use those media forms in order to spread the good news of Jesus. We make movies to tell people about God's love for them. We post things on our Facebook page or on our Snapchat stories to tell people of God's love, to remind them of, of some Bible verse or something else. We have radio stations that proclaim the good news of Jesus and His kingship to, to people all over the place 24 hours a day. And all that is good. And all that is good. But there's another way that the message of Jesus gets out. There's another way that the message of Jesus is extended to those who desperately need to know that there's forgiveness and that there's life and that there's a king who's reigning on his throne. And truthfully, it's more effective than any media world that you can live in. It's more effective than any kind of media thing, movie, radio, Facebook thing that can ever happen. It's spontaneous. It's what the Bible says, the Apostle Paul is talking in Thessalonians about it's, it's ringing out. It's reverberating out. This is what happened in Thessalonica. The evidence of their faith and their hope and their love, that which was being produced by their genuine faith and their genuine love for one another and the genuine hope and the sure sure return of Jesus, the, the evidence of that had become known of other people around them. They had seen it. It had rung out from them. It reverberated. It it echoed in the hallways. It's what one author talks about this passage. One author calls it holy gossip, where people just begin, do you know what's going on? Those Thessalonians? Have you heard what's going on? Something extraordinary is going on in that town. A new community is being formed that is driven by new values and new standards and a new ethic. Something significant is happening. And they didn't need a a media push for it. They didn't need to call a press conference for it. They didn't need to rent a billboard for it. It rang out into the streets because there, there was evidence of their faith and of their hope, and of their love. Gina and I have friends back in California who are physical and occupational therapists. They went to school for a long time, and they were really good at what they do. And they felt the call of the kingdom, a way of sacrificial servanthood. In particular, they felt the call to care for and to serve children who are physically limited. They have difficulties with their physical bodies. And they began to feel a struggle and to feel a call not only to care for these kids, but to bring them into their home and to adopt them as their children. But they also came right up and butted right up against the reality that their mountain high piles of student debt would stop them from being able to care for kids. 
Their life, the passion that they had desired, or that God had started kind of getting into their life, it, it was like they wanted to do this, but in order to pay off all their mountains of student loan debt, they had to work long hours, build their physical therapy business, get it going, get it off and going, so then maybe sometime in the future they could attend to this calling that God has had on their life to care for and, and to bring into establish a home for kids with physical limitations. But they just couldn't kick the call that God had on their life. The faith that God was calling them to, the, the sure love for one another was stirring in them and they couldn't kick it. So they did what just about everybody thought was stupid. They sold their business. They sold their nice, good-sized home. They paid off all their student loan debt. They moved to a different location. They took jobs that would give them the flexibility and the ability and to enable them to step into what God was stirring in their hearts. And today they have adopted four children, two of which have significant physical limitations. One that I think is limited and restrained into a wheelchair and the other has to wear braces on his legs almost 24 hours a day. And it is difficult in their house. And they would be first to tell you it's not glamorous. They're picking up puke and other fluids. But they remain steadfast in their faith. And they are making an eternal difference and an eternal impact, not only in these four children's lives, but they have inspired countless others. And people have called and invited them and asked them to help them walk their faith, to help them understand the calling that God has on their life. Because when you hear stories, and they never went publicly with it. They didn't write a book about it. They didn't write a, you know, a big Facebook post about it. They didn't do any of that. But when, there, when someone's genuine faith and hope and love reverberates around and you begin to hear it, it makes an eternal impact. And it can fuel our faith as well. This is what was going on with Paul. He was encouraged by the Thessalonians' faith because he had heard about their strong obedience and their courageous living in the ways of God. In the face of persecution and turmoil, they were obedient. Nothing is more impressive in Thessalonians than to watch the sequence of what's going on, that the gospel had come to them. He says, Paul says, the gospel came to you. Secondly, that you welcomed it, that you understood it, you welcomed it. And then thirdly and powerfully, it rang out from you. It rang out. Every church, crossroads included, is to be a reverberation of the life of Jesus in our life. It should ring out from here. There should be holy gossip going on in Lima. Did you hear what is going on? Their new community is being worked out in that crossroads place that is driven by a different ethic and it's different standard and different values. Something is different about those people. There ought to be a ringing out from this place. A reverberation of the goodness and life that God has come. Every church ought to be a reverberation of the life of Jesus in our community. But in order for that to happen, in order for that reality to come true, well, that's going to come the fourth quality that you see in the Thessalonians here in the opening chapter. That a church, for it to extend the gospel, has to be a community that embodies the gospel. The church has to be a community that embodies the gospel. Thessalonians here uh, experienced a radical transformation of their life. The, the Apostle Paul says they transferred their allegiance. They turned, in other words, from idol worship to the worship of Greek gods where there are statues and the idols all around them to the worship of the one true living God, to worship and serve the one true living God. They experience a radical transformation, an allegiance change from the cultural idol worship to the, to the worship of the one true living God. And while we don't have much kind of experience with this sort of idol worship where we see temples and, and statues where people are going in and worshiping, bowing down to these various false gods. We may, we, we may not have that kind of experience here. We don't find too many people with that kind of stuff. Idol worship in our culture is still very much an issue. Very much an issue. There are a myriad of God substitutes all around us, and they are equally as powerful and equally as destructive 
as the idol worship that was going on in Thessalonica. If we had a little bit of time, I think you could come up with some of the idols of our culture. Things that people go towards that substitute for God. Things that are clamoring for their attention and for their allegiance. But just to get you going, just to get your brain spinning, today the idols of money and of power, of reputation, pride, they seem to be ruling the day all over. Even infatuation with other people and another person can be an idol and a substitute. That relationship, if I just had that relationship, then that can be a God's substitute for us. In one of Paul's later books, the book to the Ephesians, Paul identifies immorality and greed as both idolatry. Immorality and greed as both idolatry because they demand so much of our attention and our allegiance. And so Paul is commending the Thessalonian church here for their clear and clean break away from idol worship and their turning towards allegiance towards God. And the same is true of the, of the Christian church today. And the same is true of our church today. That genuine faith, a mark of genuine faith that will ring out for the world to see is a clean and clear break from the idols of our culture. Friends, faith is not just an add-on to your already busy life where you just kind of toss it up on top. Some just kind of topping as you, as you will. Faith is not just fire insurance to make sure you get out of hell. Faith is something robust and is true. And it's a radical shift of our priorities from the idols of our culture to worship and to serve and to align ourselves and have our allegiance after the kingdom of God under a new way of living, not according to the culture's idols around us. For us, just like the Thessalonians, genuine faith, genuine hope, and genuine love will mean a clear break from the idols that surround us. We need to make a clear break just to be truthful and honest with you. The church needs to make a clear, and, and followers of Jesus, we need to make a clear break from the idol of greed. And we need to take up the way of generosity. The church and followers of Jesus need to make a clear and clean break away from the idol of sexual conquests and take up the way of self-control. The church and Christ followers around the world need to take a clean break away from power and reputation. And we need to take up the role of servanthood. And in this way, we might begin to embody the gospel the way of Jesus, a new way of living, to actually embody the kingdom for people. Here's what is so powerful about the Thessalonians. The Thessalonians extended the gospel that people were hearing about the gospel and they were convinced of the truth of Jesus as king and his resurrection. They were convinced of the power that the gospel has over people's lives, not primarily by what they heard, but by what they saw by what they saw. The Thessalonians believers were driven by a different ethic and they lived distinctively different lives. They had a genuine love for one another and a steadfast hope in the sure return of Jesus, looking forward to the promised kingdom where all will be well. And the church, our church, is to be a divine foretaste of that kingdom to come, where we are to embody a way of life that stands in contrast to the idols of our day and the culture around us. To embody a genuine and countercultural way, the way of the kingdom. John Stada, an Anglican priest, theologian of the 20th century, he wrote this, and I found these words powerfully true and needed for us today. No church can spread the gospel without any, with any degree of integrity, let alone credibility, unless it has been visibly changed by the gospel it preaches. We need to look like what we are talking about. 
It is not enough to receive the gospel and to pass it on. We must embody it in our common life of faith, love, joy, peace, righteousness, and hope. I wonder sometimes, I wonder sometimes if the church in general, if the church in general has lost some of its effective witness in our world because we haven't made a clean and clear break from the idols of greed and of sexual misconduct, of power, or of pride, or some other God substitute that it is just as infected our churches and our lives as it is the world around us. We haven't made a clear break where our allegiance isn't the culture around us, but our allegiance is God alone. And part of the reason why the church is losing ground and is not as effective in its witness around us is that we look just like everybody else. And my prayer for a crossroads, increasingly more these days, especially as our culture is changing, my prayer for us individually and collectively, is that we would be a community that embodies a way of life that is so consistent with the kingdom where we transfer our allegiance from the idols of greed and of power, sexual misconduct, to the, to the ways of generosity, sacrifice, servanthood, of love, of faith, and of hope where we are driven by the ways of God. And may that ring out from here where we don't have to tell everybody, but they see it. They see it in how you greet somebody. They see it how you pray for somebody. They see it in the language that comes from out of your mouth. They see it in the actions that come from your hands. Friends, may you and I turn from the idols of our culture that so entrap and enslave us And may we find that the ways of Jesus are abundant and eternal and good. And may our watching world see that the gospel rings true because they see it in you and they see it in us. It's good for us this evening or this morning to come to the Lord's table because it's because of the Lord's table that we are bound together. It's because of the sacrifice and the death and the resurrection of Jesus that we have life. And we come reminding ourselves of that extreme sacrifice. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are to examine ourselves before we come to the table. And friends, this is not an examination to see if you're worthy to receive this table or receive the grace that is here. Friends, this table is a table for sinners. None of us are worthy of the grace that is offered to us in Jesus. Rather, the, the examination that, the Paul invites us, that Paul invites us to is to examine, to understand the sacredness of this meal, the goodness, and to meet Christ in this meal. So I'm going to invite you just to a moment of silent reflection to realize that Christ is present and calling you to an allegiance to his kingdom through his blood shed on the cross. And in a moment, we'll lead you through our liturgy and then you'll be dismissed from the backs of your sections you'll come up here there'll be four stations you can take the bread and the cup just kind of make a circle around your section go back to your seat in that direction but if you have a burden in your heart this morning or some area that you need God to step in and you got to show up then I'd invite you to come and ask for prayer there'll be somebody on either side of the worship center and you can come and kneel at the kneeling rails and we would love to pray with you Maybe it's some idol that you are entrapped or enslaved by that you need God's direction and God's empowerment to turn from it. Then bring it to God. Confess it before him. And may we stand and pray with you. Or maybe it's some other area that you just need God to show up. We'd invite you during these times to not only come and experience God's grace through the communion table, but to come and allow us to pray with and for you. So if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. Prepare your heart for the communion. For those who are serving communion, you can come. You can get ready, and then we'll lead you in our communion liturgy on the screens in just a minute.